hello and welcome everybody. My name is uh, Jacek. I've been working in software development for about 12 years now uh, between uh, development roles and scrum master roles in very different fields and uh, I would like to talk to you today about uh, a case study for a less huge adoption so a large scale scrum huge adoption and uh, the circumstances are kind of odd. I've done uh, quite a few uh, of uh, similar talks before on uh, meetups and conferences, but I've never used a medium like Zoom. So this will be kind of experimental. And uh, I, I would be very, uh, very grateful for your patience if we, if we stumble into some, uh, some awkwardness along the way, because this is still uh, quite new territory to me. Uh, and I can see that uh, quite a lot of you have enabled cameras and uh, that is great. That makes, a, that makes my job a lot more easy because I can actually see that I'm talking to people and uh, not just uh, to myself. And I can also try and take subtle cues from you as I, as I speak if something is maybe uh, weird or if there, 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 there is something that I need to go back to. Uh, also, I would like to see how uh, good this medium can be for uh, asking questions during the talk. What I usually do in the meetup talk is I encourage people to just uh, ask a question if they see something they would like explained in more detail as I go. And uh, I would encourage the same here. If this ends up not working because of the audio video delays or whatever, we might change this rule later on. But right now, let's see if we can just potentially ask questions during the presentation and uh, how well that will work, okay? If not, then we will just uh, try and find a different solution. So uh, seeing as this was originally to be a talk on the Less Warsaw Meetup, I was kind of prepared to, uh, to give this talk to, uh, to members of the Less Warsaw community. But uh, because this kind of evolved online, we now have people from, from all over and we might have people with very different experiences with less from all over. This might include people who don't know exactly what large scale Scrum is and just came here to check this out. So if you don't know uh, like the basic, uh, uh, the basic tenets of less or the basic rules of less, Please let us know uh, in the questionnaire. Trzeciak, uh, if you could uh, if you could share the questionnaire, then I could uh, maybe uh, adjust the presentation a little bit, and I can spend a little more time or a little less time getting into the actual less basics. Okay, so it's uh, it's about three to one. So I'm I'm going to uh, do a very very short introduction. Don't, don't, don't be too alarmed. It'll be very very brief. I'll try I'll try and make it as brief as uh, as possible. Uh, so uh, large scale Scrum is a framework for agile product development with more than one team, and uh, this has evolved organically from a single team Scrum where it was found to be relatively easy to enforce a agile way of working and to get people uh, working in a way that enables uh, frequent delivery and responsiveness to change. But things got a lot more difficult as people started adding teams. So throughout a series of experiments, the creators of what later became large scale Scrum figured out uh, what was supposed to be the simplest way of retaining the principles of Scrum in a multi-team environment. These principles include a single product backlog governed by a single product owner, uh, which has customer-centric items which are prioritized. So we do not have testing items, we do not have items for specific software components, we have end-to-end -end, uh, feature items that uh, give some, some kind of value to the customers. And this is prioritized uh, in a business-centric manner. Then the end-to-end -end feature teams uh, take items from this backlog uh, in priority order. And the coordination is being done by the teams, between the teams, without any centralized role. The Scrum Master has a support, supporting role here who makes sure that the enabling structure of the organization is in place so that the teams can actually 
decentralize this uh, coordination efforts and that everything runs smoothly. So this is about the, the briefest introduction to less that I have ever given. And uh, there is a problem with this framework as you keep adding teams to this. Adding teams and adding people to any organization will make things more and more difficult. However, there is a almost hard limit on this because if we have one product owner and one prioritized backlog, uh, a few teams are still quite possible to manage if we are supposed to uh, give a batch of new valuable items for teams to do every two weeks or so. But when we pass 15, 20, 30 teams, the amount of items that go through the system, through the product organization every sprint would be so huge that it would be impossible for one person to uh, keep up with this. So it was found uh, heuristically, experimentally, that with about eight teams in the organization, this begins to break down. So uh, there was another variant of uh, less included, uh, uh, created called less huge. So large scale scrum huge for organizations which have more than eight development teams working on a single product. And this will be the subject of, uh, of our talk today, a case study of a particularly huge organization which uses less huge. The less huge framework is very, very similar to the less framework, but it adds another level in the product management uh, aspect of things. So seeing as the product owner was the, uh, was the bottleneck of the previous system and just couldn't handle more than, than eight teams worth of prioritization, a area product owner was added. So this additional role is meant to have uh, a product owner authority on a part of the product backlog, not the entire product backlog, but a subset of the items which are selected in a quite particular way. So again, it might be the temptation and it very often is the temptation for huge organizations to say, okay, if we have this one central product backlog and area product backlogs, we can have the specification area backlog, the development area backlog, and the testing area backlog. And then we won't have to change anything in our organization and we're set. Uh, we don't want to do this, absolutely. It is imperative that the area backlogs are still customer centric, but they uh, address a certain aspect of the product that actually makes sense to the customer. In this uh, particular case, we will, be, we will be talking about a telecom company working on a product which is uh, a mobile network infrastructure. So the devices that we use uh, with uh, mobile phones or whatever to get reception, to be able to watch YouTube on the tram, etc. So in terms of this organization, uh, the, the example requirement areas that we could have would be coverage, we could have throughput, we could have uh, a area of uh, network resilience. So these are things that don't necessarily correspond to one certain activity in the development. They don't necessarily correspond to one certain uh, component in the, uh, in the development, but they will be recognizable and valuable somehow to customers. And we want to keep it, to keep it that way. Uh, we assign teams to areas semi-permanently. So this is not a kind of organizational structure because if we have certain aspects of the products that are super important to customers today, they might not be important at all in two years. Maybe because of the market changes, maybe because we simply have enough functionality in this particular area that we don't really need to focus on developing uh, there anymore. So teams changing requirement areas should be a fairly regular occurrence on a product level. However, it should be fairly rare from a team level. For example, if we have 100 teams in an organization and we have a team change a area every sprint, uh, we will have uh, on average uh, a team change, uh, change an area every 100, once every 100 sprints. So this will be quite rare because with a two week sprint, that would be four years which is almost never from a team's perspective, very frequently from a product owner's perspective. 
and the role of the product owner be, uh, becomes in this less huge variant, creating, removing, modifying requirement areas. So looking at the product from a very high level perspective and delegating the requirements, uh, the, the requirement area backlog uh, work to the uh, area product owners. So this is still very much a less adoption in each of the uh, requirement areas. All of them work on the same product and the communication is still uh, the response the, the coordination is still the responsibility of the teams and the handling of the dependencies is still completely decentralized. So as we can probably see, if you've had any experience working for a huge organization that has hundreds of teams, this is extremely different to how most of these organizations are structured by default. And the, the context of this particular organization is a pre-existing structure uh, with a specifically single specialist and component-based uh, based structure. So we have component X, Y, Z organizations. We have uh, several testing organizations. We have several specification organizations, etc. To make things more difficult, we have a few thousand people working on the same product with a few hundred teams distributed across several countries, time zones, and cultures. And in, uh, if we can actually get an agile working model in such an organization, then I think that would be conclusive to say that we can pretty much do that anywhere. So how would we go about uh, transforming this huge uh, component-based organization into a less organization. Uh, there are three basic adoption principles for large-scale Scrum. Uh, these are deep and narrow, over broad and shallow. So when we have this huge paradigm shift of, the, of an organization which is supposed to go from one structure to another, we can do this uh, either once, uh, once for, for the entire organization and just say, okay, Starting tomorrow, the specification organization does not exist. The testing organization does not exist. The component organizations uh, stop existing as well. Everybody is put into cross-functional teams. We don't use centralized project management anymore. And coordination is the responsibility of the teams. Go. Uh, doing this with a company of this scale and the product so huge would be extremely risky, very likely fatal for the organization and the product. Because the amount of uh, problems that this fledgling organization would have to overcome immediately would be just huge and would likely either grind production to a halt uh, for a very long frustrating time or until the product runs out of funds. So generally, this is quite uh, recommended for the smaller large-scale Scrum organizations. If you have 50 people in your organization, you can probably pull that off. If you have 300 or 5,000, you should probably go step by step. And there are two ways of doing this step by step, deep and narrow or broad and shallow. The broad and shallow approach has its uh, upsides and the upsides are it's usually a lot more comfortable for the organization to do this stepwise. What we mean with this is, let's say we take a look at our current definition of done, and let's say that we want the definition of done to include the entire product in some time. So we can keep adding new components, new testing levels, and every few months we will have the entire organization adopt this new definition of done, which brings us one step closer to what we want to achieve with a less like setup. Uh, this also has some downsides. The downsides being this can sometimes be too comfortable for organizations. This kind of changes are relatively easy to fake, to adopt in a very, very shallow way that uh, in the end results actually means that nothing really changes. A very common example of this that we see is component-based organizations which adopt Scrum and leave their testing teams intact, their specification teams intact, and their component teams intact. Everybody works in sprints. Everybody has the stand-ups every day, the sprint reviews every two weeks, but no one can really inspect and adapt over a sprint. 
because the developers are waiting for the input from the specification and the testers are waiting for input from the developers and it's just a remodeled waterfall because it was uh, very broad, the entire organization which was touched, but nothing but the barest cosmetics actually changed. So another way of introducing this change stepwise is a deep and narrow approach. So we don't want to revolutionize the way the entire organization works overnight, but we can't do that for a certain subset of the organization. Let's say we start with one requirements area that will be up to eight feature teams. So about uh, 60, 70 people involved in that in the end uh, versus the, the remainder of the product, like three or 5,000 people that would continue working as they did before. This way we can get some of the early problems out of the way uh, while they affect only a small number of people and we have already an established structure as we ramp up the organization. So we want to go deep and narrow, we want to have very heavy changes that impact a few of the teams. Uh, another uh, another um, principle is top down and bottom up with huge organizational structures that are paradigm changing like this, we can have this fail two ways very, very easily. We can either have the people working on the product reading up on a blog post or a very convincing book and figuring we want to do uh, DevOps, we want to do end-to-end -end feature teams, we want to do sprints uh, or Scrum in general, and uh, not having a buy-in from the management or the exact other way around. We could have management reading an interesting blog post or article in the magazine and saying, we need to model our company this way and we need to start working agile next week with nobody in the company actually knowing what agile means. Both of these are, uh, are a recipe for failure with deep organizational changes because uh, the bottom up efforts will be trumped by, uh, by organizational structure and uh, management action pretty much every time if they come into conflict. So we can't really will end to end working on a component based organization because people's salaries are at stake, people's uh, career development is tied to that. Uh, similarly, we can't force a change of uh, mindset and we can't force a change of mentality onto people in the teams just because management says that we have to start doing things uh, differently if no one understands that or if no one knows what these changes actually mean. So we need to correlate the two. We need to have the top-down support uh, and, and driving force and we need to have the bottom-up uh, understanding and, and support of the changes in order to succeed with such a change. And lastly, an extremely important rule that uh, also gets uh, overlooked too often in uh, significant organizational changes, use volunteers. So if we do the change gradually, we definitely want to start with a set of volunteers who think this is either a good idea, uh, this will help us, or it's just an interesting enough uh, approach to try out and see what the results are. If we change the entire paradigm of the organization and say that starting tomorrow we, we will decentralize the dependency management, uh, the teams are end-to-end, -end, et cetera, et cetera, and the teams really don't want that, then this will fail very, very quickly in a way that's very, very ugly. So taking these three principles, how did we approach that in the huge, huge organization that we had? So we started by going very deep with some volunteer teams. So some teams were identified within the product uh, with support from the head of product. So the person who could make organizational changes by, by, by their, on their own. And uh, these teams received uh, some large scale scrum training, a lot of technical practices training, and uh, a lot of support in their day-to-day -day work by shadowing, mentoring, et cetera. Uh, once we had enough teams and enough people actually interested in potentially implementing the change, uh, there was a workshop with a crosscut of the, uh, of the product. It was basically people from the teams with different specializations, testing developments, uh, uh, specification, etc. Some of them were still in their dedicated sub-organizations. We had their product owners, their respective line managers, 
the project managers and program managers and product managers from, from uh, the, the high business level. We have the head of product, which is a hugely important uh, person to have there, because if you want to make this kind of decision, you need to have the person who can make the decision in the room and a lot of different levels of management. So basically a cross cut of the uh, organization. We had a training on uh, what large scale scrum actually is, which takes about three days. And these are not sparsely populated three days. There is a lot of material to cover and a lot of uh, implications to analyze very, very deeply. Uh, so after, uh, after having done that, uh, the organization made the decision that we would be going for a actual large scale scrum adoption and that we would start with a few requirement areas. Some of the requirement areas were identified based on the product's current needs and we tried to match those needs to the specializations of the volunteers that we had. So it turns out that we had volunteers with two major, with, with huge expertise in two major software components that were touched by uh, the requirements that, that were in the requirement area. So that was a very good start. And we needed to bridge a gap in the uh, domain knowledge uh, in terms of specification uh, and uh, high level testing. So with these, we had an interesting situation because we had no volunteers to join the adoption from the specification side. We had some volunteers from the testing side. So we chose to incorporate the volunteers with the testing expertise into the existing feature teams. We basically supported the teams in figuring out themselves where they want these experts to go. And they, they, they ended up being quite happy with the, uh, with the decision. Uh, on the other hand, we needed to get some expertise about specification from the existing uh, single specialist sub organization. So what ended up happening because we were still working on one product and the specification still needed to be uh, aligned between these uh, different parts of the product, the volunteers from the team would receive mentoring and would attend some of these synchronization and uh, uh, knowledge sharing meetings uh, that were previously only for the specification uh, people. So some of, the, some of the skills we incorporated into the teams using volunteers some of the skills we incorporated into the teams by learning and we were ready to uh, start. All of this sounds like a extreme amount of work, of cost and of potential risk for the organization to incur. Uh, just uh, thinking about such a deep change and such a radical change into how these things work. So let's take two steps back and ask ourselves, why an organization would even consider that? What would be the driving uh, motivation to try and uh, adopt large scale Scrum? Uh, the answer lies in the product perspective and it will not be very surprising to uh, people who spent some time working with, uh, uh, with uh, lean companies and uh, with, with agile in general. Uh, it was a huge pain in this kind of organization to get feedback on the product development or inspection on its state on a regular basis. Because if we have so many different sub organizations with their own uh, development queues, it becomes very difficult to insert new requirements into the products because the moment I have a very important requirement from the customer now, uh, I will give this to the specification people. They will break this down into uh, uh, various uh, product comp components that we have. Some of those components will be able to complete their work very quickly, like in a month. Some of those components will be knee deep in very, very important work that was identified a year and a half ago or two years ago. So very frequently in organizations uh, that are, that are uh, based on these single specializations, it becomes a pain that the cycle time reaches months, sometimes even several years between a requirement arrives and we can actually push it out the door to the customer. And this was the case here. It turns out that if you uh, optimize your organization around single specialists, what you actually optimize for is not the speed of delivering the, the features outside, but it's the, the busyness of the people. So all the experts in all these sub organizations can be very, very busy working very hard 
and deliver, even delivering their parts very quickly. But as a whole, because of there's, there is one bottleneck in a certain area of the product, uh, we, uh, the, the entire end-to-end -end cycle time uh, reaches years. And this is, this is just not acceptable. Uh, what, this, uh, what this also causes is a lot of problems in the scoping. Very frequently with such complex technical requirements as uh, with the telecom industry, it turns out that uh, doing just 20 or 10% of the work gives us 90% of the customer value for, for these uh, requirements. However, which 10% that is can be pretty difficult to identify upfront. So we would like to have the possibility to descope these things as we go, which in an organization with 15 different queues is very difficult because every time you want to make a change, you have to coordinate between the queues. You have to look at the implications in terms of what that means for the other components, how that impacts the schedule of testing. Uh, if the, uh, of the project manager and the owner person of this topic is okay with that. And uh, it becomes extremely complex. We would like this to be a lot more easy. And during the already mentioned workshop, it was uh, decided that Les would be a worthy candidate of looking for a solution to these problems. So this is the product perspective and the justification for, for why the organization tried to uh, do the large scale scrum adoption. This requires some organizational changes to enable though, because our current organization is definitely not set up uh, to solve these problems the way that Les would envision that. So what we need to have in place at the very minimum is a decentralized dependency management with a centralized prioritization. Whereas now we have kind of the opposite. Uh, we want to decentralize dependency, dependency management. So we want to give this authority to the teams uh, to uh, come up with the, uh, with the solution in terms of the different uh, impacted uh, software components, in terms of uh, gathering together the requirements, in terms of making sure that the entire thing is tested on an end-to-end basis. Uh, and we need to give the teams the authority to do so, because if we just say, okay, we are now doing less and we leave the existing component based processes in place, then the teams will likely come to a wall very, very quickly. So we need to change that while maintaining a centralized prioritization. So the product owner does not delve into the technical uh, aspects of the, of the work. They do not take an interest in what components are impacted, in what the testing schedule will be, because testing is just a part of the definition of done, but they are the sole authority uh, for the team on what is the next important thing to do. And how do we do that? Because we have several thousand people who are working in a very different way on the same product. We don't want to have uh, two products, one working the agile way and one working the waterfall way, because we still have the same customers, we'll still have the same code base and uh, release schedule. So how do we uh, make sure that these two worlds don't eat each other? Uh, what we did was we took the approach of a um, adapter uh, or uh, s several uh, actual software subsystems and we treated the organization as, uh, as having its own API. So we would take a look at all the activities that would be covered by the roles that we specifically do not want to have in our large scale scrum adoption. People like program managers, project managers, uh, single component specialists, etc. And we took a look at those and we asked ourselves, how can we make sure that the requirements of the organization are fulfilled while not altering the way of work of our team in a way that would destroy our less adoption. So what we came up with was uh, there were these meetings where the project managers and the program managers would look at the status of the, of the uh, specific components and their work on certain features, whether it was 50% done in component A, 100% done in component B, uh, fully specified and testing would start in a month or so, we would give a job to our area product owner to pretend to be uh, one of those program managers, but give them uh, 
information about, about the progress, uh, which is limited to the end-to-end -end testing perspective, because the organization would be notified that the teams working on these functionalities do, do, do the work end-to-end, -end, so they do all the required work in all the components and the testing in one step. So actually, it's a lot less upfront planning because we don't specify the entire half a year of working that way. We just specify sprints at a time. Uh, but they knew that the status they were getting is uh, actually real. And if it's there, then we might reintegrate these functionalities that have been delivered by the less uh, requirement area teams into the normal uh, product uh, delivery schedule. We needed to make sure that shared code ownership works between the teams, because if we don't have shared code ownership, if we still have a mapping of this team can touch this part of code, then we don't really have uh, a possibility to operate with uh, customer centric uh, feature teams. So in, in organizations of that, scale, of that scale, it is already usually a fact that some shared code ownership has to exist. If we have even 30 teams in a component organization, they will very rarely be distributed into 30 completely separate subparts of this component. That would just be too much management overhead and it would be tons of waste. So most component organizations don't work that way on that scale. And it was already a fact of the matter that uh, there was uh, shared code ownership within component organizations. However, the rules of the shared code ownership in terms of processes, in terms of technical standards, et cetera, were still different in the, in the sub-organizations. Here, because we had mostly two components impacted with uh, volunteer teams uh, who had strong backgrounds in these particular components, they agreed to give each other an introductory training on that, uh, on mostly how to utilize the automated regression of those components to make sure that you didn't break anything inadvertently with your changes. So this is the most important bit. Uh, there was also the overhead of the architectural design and the uh, responsibilities of that component, where to look for information. Then the teams agreed to give each other supportive code reviews and consulting over time, should that be needed. Uh, the code reviews were non-blocking code reviews, which we will get back to uh, in some time. And their main goal was not to potentially detect any errors that the other team might have made in the, in the code, but rather maximize the learning and make it easy for the other team to acquire some knowledge in the uh, expertise area that, uh, that they lacked. Uh, and this also required some uh, management support in terms of the competence transfer because these, these uh, teams were also distributed. It was a huge force multiplier that uh, we, uh, we had the management support for certain people from the team to travel to another location, to work there for, for a week or so. And that way, the speed of learning in terms of, the, in terms of the new component is just barely comparable to anything you could get uh, via something like, let's say, a Zoom call. Uh, so this was a, a very important step in the organizational perspective as well. However, to maintain this ease and to uh, make this learning safe also for the uh, for the teams, this requires quite a bit of technical backbone, and uh, there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of conditions that need to be fulfilled for that to actually have any kind of chance of working. Uh, one of the very very key practices that we employed in the adoption was uh, CI or continuous integration. Uh, how do, you, how do you understand, this is going to be a, a, an experimental question, let's see how that works. How do you understand continuous integration? What, what, what do you think the practice is? Okay. Uh, and you expect us to write in the comments or to speak out loud? Um, let's, let, let's see if, if, if one person can, can speak out loud. You, uh, but Pavel says you integrate the code continuously. Jürgen says, says pretty much the same. 
Uh, and and they are right. Uh, oh no no no! I just wanted to say this to have a build system. <laughs> Yeah, this, this, this was a failed experiment, so I'll, I'll refrain from asking questions in that manner for the future. <laughs> uh, but a very, a very uh, common misunderstanding of continuous integration comes from the fact that there is so much tooling label, labeled as continuous integration. And it might be true that Jenkins supports continuous integration, Cruise Control supports continuous integration, but they are not continuous integration in themselves. Having a green Jenkins build in itself that does not mean that you have continuous integration, rather it's the practice of integrating continuously. So this means uh, that uh, you integrate uh, into the code base uh, ideally several times a day, hopefully even several times an hour if your product is big enough. If you have a hundred teams working on it, and you only have a few comments per day into the master or trunk or whatever the, the name is in the VCS that you use, then chances are you have a discontinuity there. So uh, we want to have a uh, trunk-based uh, working model, and we also don't want to have any blocking pull requests or code reviews. Uh, we don't want to work on branches because if we do that, that basically means that we delay the integration of the product. And we already had uh, quite a established CI mentality uh, in a lot of the product and uh, a lot of uh, supporting structure around that. This, of course, requires a very good test automation because if you want to make sure that your code is properly integrated into the master several times a day, uh, asking humans to click through the entirety of the functionality that you could have touched uh, is uh, inhumane and uh, probably won't work because there's just too much functionality to cover and this functionality will just become bigger and bigger as you develop a product because you will just add more and more on top of that. So you need very good test automation with, uh, that is reliable and that is quick. In this particular case, we had a automation that gave us a roughly 99% uh, certainty that uh, if a 15 minute regression uh, passes, then we haven't broken anything. The 1% would still happen. It would still uh, sometimes happen that something passes our quick regression and then it turns out either with automated testing the next day on, uh, on the slower, higher order tests that something broke or manually when people do something that, that something broke. But, but this is still an acceptable cost if it happens rarely enough. And it did in this case. So for 99% of the time, we had a automated answer. You broke the code or you didn't break the code. And based on that, we could uh, either push it or not push it. If it was already pushed, then we could just make a quick revert and make sure that all the teams working on the product including those uh, in the new and old sub organizations had a stable enough uh, basis to work on. We also utilized uh, acceptance test driven development. Uh, this is uh, slightly less known as a practice, I guess, than just the basic units uh, TDD. What this, uh, what this is about is a mode of working uh, within the team, but also between the team and the stakeholders where you begin the sprint uh, or you begin working on items by defining skeletons of automated tests in a language that is comprehensible to the stakeholders. There are several languages that are created pretty much solely for that purpose, like Robot or Cucumber, that you can just write sentences in and uh, people, can, uh, people from, from the business side can understand them relatively easily. Then you just connect the functionalities of the automated tests uh, under the hood and uh, you have uh, in one place uh, a documentation of the functionality, something that uh, is very, very clear about what the tests do and also a way of tracking that the, uh, that the functionality is already done. Uh, we also utilize communicating in code. It is a very, very common pain for the huge organizations that people uh, don't know what uh, other people are working on 
or they miss the moments where they should have communicated with someone about a certain feature. Let's say we have a feature to, uh, to, to do and it impacts the code in a certain way. We know that we need to uh, add a few methods to this class, but when we go there and when we, uh, when we make the changes, we fi find out that the class has been split by different uh, uh, by, by, by a different team into several different classes. And then we say, okay, this, this should be one responsibility from our point of view, but they already did this and we, we kind of missed, uh, missed the point. Uh, if you do integrate frequently enough, this is not uh, that big of a deal because uh, these missed opportunities, these, uh, these problems that you, uh, that you stumble on, are still small if all your comments are 15 lines, 14 lines long, then at worst case scenario, you just lost uh, the work of those uh, 40 lines, but you notice that you have to communicate with the team. This means, however, that the frequency needs to be very high. So integration barriers, if you want to communicate in code and use hints of other people working in similar classes or places in code that you need to uh, communicate, that means that the integration barriers become coordination barriers and branching impedes this communication method. So it becomes not only a barrier and delay of integration, but it also impacts the communication between teams, uh, which, is, uh, which seems like a good moment to address Wukash's uh, uh, remark that technically whenever you, you pull, you create a branch and you push often. Oh no, okay. Uh, yes, local branches, even if you don't name the branch, they are still branches. But if you push often enough, like uh, uh, a few times per hour, uh, then the, 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 the cost of that is not that big. But if you name the branch and let's say you keep it on your local uh, work, uh, workplace for a week or so, if you break the tests and then you fix them after two weeks and then you push, you notice, huh, there has been a lot of changes on the trunk in the meantime, and uh, this is a lot more painful than it would have been otherwise. Uh, so the, the, the worst case is once per day. This is the limit that they've actually had for themselves uh, before establishing XP. Before it became continuous integration, it was daily build. So now we have a lot more infrastructure in place to support that. So the line should be significantly higher than once per day. Uh, so these were the technical uh, aspects that we had in place and a lot of the, um, uh, we depended heavily on having these in place before we made the organizational changes. So before we transitioned into, uh, into feature teams from component based teams, we made sure that the regression supports that uh, in, a, in a way that, uh, that is meaningful, in a way that provides a safe learning mechanism and uh, doesn't break the product. Otherwise, doing this in one step could be very, very risky because people will break things more if they don't know the components uh, they, they work on. If they don't have a safety net of tests to tell them that easily, then the organization might conflate uh, these technical problems with the working model itself. In, in reality, it is a combination of uh, this problem being more visible with a uh, feature team. However, this just shows that the test automation is not up to snuff. And finally, we arrive to the team perspective of, uh, of the adoption, which is uh, the perspective of uh, the, the, the volunteers in the, uh, in the requirement area. And this is where we come to one of the tenants of less, which is large scale Scrum and Scrum, uh, by which I mean, these uh, observations are just basic observations that you probably have with any team adopting Scrum in a single team organization. Uh, we ditched internal roles within teams. That means that where we used to have in this organization, dedicated developers and dedicated testers in the same team, we recognize that as uh, incompatible with the self-managing team model because what that means it, uh, it, it, uh, yeah, and the, the ditching of the internal roles does not mean that everybody does everything, which is a, another fairly common misconception about both uh, Scrum and about less. 
so we don't want to have everybody doing all the work required uh, to make the feature uh, get off the ground just because it is a team responsibility. Rather than that, we want to utilize the specialization of uh, the, the team that we have to the biggest possible extent until it becomes limiting. What I mean by this is, let's say, for the sake of argument, that I am a COBOL programmer and I have a team, cross-functional team, that in this sprint has a lot of work to do in, uh, in the COBOL component of the system. Uh, it would make sense for me to utilize my, uh, my skill and I don't have to learn anything new. If I have Java in, in the product, if I have C++ in the product, I don't need to do that. I don't need to do business analysis. If, if all my time during the sprint can be spent with my expertise of writing COBOL and there's still uh, all of that work uh, goes to further the team in uh, getting their sprint goal, then that's fine. I don't need to learn anymore. However, let's say that I only have one function in COBOL to modify, and then the rest of the work for the sprint actually touches different component. I could look forward into the backlog and try and find some, some work that probably has something to do with my component. Maybe I will start the work for the next sprint or five sprints ahead, or if there's nothing because COBOL is basically a dead language, then I'll just rewrite some of the functions that I already have because they can be still prettier. Uh, that would be the case if I have uh, a component-centric or a uh, um, speciality-centric uh, role. However, in a scrum team, uh, this means that I would rather have to look at the um, specialties that other people have to support them even if that means that I need to spend a lot more time on Stack Exchange or Googling on how to dockerize things or figuring what uh, package in Java to use for this. Uh, while we have a lot of other experts who could do that better, however, they are already very busy working on high uh, priority items. So I might as well do the work uh, slower, but uh, do the work that is a lot more useful for, for my team. So. This is what it means to have no internal roles. In, the, in, in this instance, that's, uh, that mostly meant breaking down the barrier between the testers and the developers and the team. So this means that while you had developers and testers nominally in the same organizational unit, it was literally the point of having two separate roles for developers to be able to ignore what's going on in testing and vice versa. Uh, when we stopped that, it turned out that there is a lot of uh, improvements that could be done with the developers testing, uh, with the developers automation expertise in testing. So this caused the entire team to focus mostly on filling holes in test automation for a few sprints, after which the manual work required by the testers was significantly uh, less than it used to be. And uh, they, in turn, managed to uh, get some time to hone their skills in other areas. So they managed to uh, move on to uh, some more business analysis, some more specification work, uh, or uh, some, some more um, lower order testing and eventually development based on what the team needed at the time, even though that uh, did have a uh, entry cost at the beginning. But it was very interesting to see how many things the team found shocking once we broke that uh, barrier down and they thought that we absolutely cannot tolerate the state of things in our product. As an end result, uh, the, uh, the automation benefited significantly uh, and the team became a lot more flexible, needing a lot less external support to actually be able to deliver the end-to-end -end customer value and even some of the people who were on the fence about switching this model, uh, in the end, after having worked in that model for a few uh, months, decided that this was the way to go and uh, they don't want to go back to the previous single specialist uh, model uh, ever again. So to bring that back to our goals of the product perspective, Having, having incurred the cost of entry and having had the teams work slower for some time because they needed to learn a lot of things, we managed to increase the frequency of uh, the feedback and inspection quite significantly. 
and it was estimated by the the, the people working in for, from the with that from the product management side that the stuff that would have uh, taken more than a year would uh, would now be uh, visible in less than than half a year mostly because uh, not in no small part due, due to the fact that this coping was now a lot more accessible because we didn't have to juggle all of these queues with the different specializations and the different sub organizations but rather than that every two weeks we could see a small step into the direction of uh, of what's uh, what we wanted to bring to the customer surely enough there were several estimation explosions. There were several parts that the teams estimated to be a few hundreds uh, or a hundred hours of work, which turns out to be more like a few thousand hours of work. Obviously, uh, in, in, uh, after having uh, the appropriate uh, transformation, because that was not the, the, the estimation unit. And... Uh, this model was was found by both the teams and uh, and the and the product management to support these goals in uh, in a very very uh, useful way. Not by everybody, obviously, as always with uh, with a change of that scale with several thousand people, you will have people who uh, feel uh, negatively about this as well as you know, people who feel positively. One of the biggest drawbacks was. Uh, the people who felt very, very passionate about a specific branch of technology uh, now would spend uh, some time less on, on this particular technology because uh, their scope of responsibility would narrow greatly. However, on the whole, uh, the people in, involved in the requirement area uh, saw more advantages than disadvantages of that because this also made the work more meaningful. This also gave them a lot more autonomy and... Uh, a lot more sense of meaning while being able to deliver these things very frequently and uh, this uh, and, and this is probably the worst slide that i have ever made in the history of my trainings and uh, and talks uh, however this uh, is kind of meant to illustrate a point and the nature of this gordian knot of a graph is to cycle back through all the topics that I've mentioned so far, not exactly in isolation, but as separate points, and to show how interconnected these are. So the arrows uh, in this case mean, for example, uh, it is my mental model that the test automation enables continuous integration. Without that, we, we, we can't just have continuous integration. And because we have continuous integration, we can have decentralized dependency management. Because the team, because the product is uh, is constantly integrated, so we don't have to take that into account. Uh, because the, the the tests are automated, we can enable shared code ownership. Because without this basic technological backbone, it would be very, very dangerous, difficult, and scary for the teams to venture into unknown parts of code. So, uh, the 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 main point that I wanted to drive home with this slide is not the exact nature of the dependencies here, but just how many there are. It is very, very difficult and potentially impossible to look at any of this in isolation and uh, not come up against a wall very, very soon in your adoption. And in, in, in the case of this particular huge telecom company, I think the biggest uh, contributing factor to the, the, the success that we ended up having was the amount of upfront work uh, in technical excellence that was done before we actually started to make meaningful organizational shifts. Because that means that uh, there was a lot more safety behind these changes and we could demonstrate some gains fairly quickly. However, with each organization, uh, this can vary a lot. So this will have a very different dynamic if you have a huge embedded telecom product, a different dynamic uh, that, you, uh, that, that, that you would have if you worked on software for hospitals or airplanes, and a very different dynamic that you would have if you were working on an online store, depending on the organization's size, culture, tech stack, pre-existing structure, etc. So, all of this complexity can be very different for each organization, 
but it is extremely uh, important in my view to be aware of this interconnectivity of the aspects of technical team organization and product perspectives on your adoption and i do not think you can that adding more content to that would actually help unless to, to, to actually just make the make the make the point of all of this being a extremely entangled mess <laughs> and uh, this is uh, the, the the prepared part of the uh, of the presentation that i had for today i now notice that i that I kind of didn't uh, include the organizational part in the beginning, but it's it was the plan all along to have a hour long session, uh, then a uh, then a Q and A, and uh, I also wanted to plug uh, a open space meeting for less practitioners that we wanted to have also on Zoom uh, next week. Uh, so that's uh, that's it from my side in terms of the prepared content is there anything else you would like me to go back to explain in more detail or just any any kind of uh, questions you have it's the problem with the with, with the communication channel again i'm not sure how to interpret this silence uh if anybody has has a question please feel free to uh, put that in the chat box chat box maybe this in this way we won't in, uh, interrupt each other and we can just read questions one after another and i'll, I'll just pick, pick the the questions as they go because i uh, i'm i'm assuming that, that that there is still something uh something i could probably expand on i would have a question mm -hmm. or sorry yeah no, no, no. Hi. Hi, Isaac. Um, hey. How long uh, did this technical preparation took place? I mean, you can imagine that you've been, you, you get hired for a job transformation, right? And then you walk in there and you start to explain how actually things should be, um, should be done. You might do some informed consent workshop with the executives and, and so on and so on. But my imagination is that, okay, so now you explain them and they buy into idea, okay, now we have to sort of first prepare the ground before we proceed with the structural changes. Uh, so how, what are they, how they react, how they respond to that and how long does taking these practices into place, how long do they, how long does it take? Because I can imagine uh, it's not just about uh, explaining developers, okay, continuous integration is not about green build, uh, but to learn them really continuous integ uh, to integrate continuously and all that it just takes a hell of a lot longer so so depending on uh, the, the the interpretation of that question anywhere between two and ten years I guess <laughs> because the the boundaries are quite fuzzy in this it was not the case that a agile transformation was the end goal there the agile transformation was kind of a byproduct of just trying to make the, the product incrementally better and the organization incrementally better at, uh, at, delivering, at delivering the product. So, uh, you know, when you, when you look at uh, any kind of technical coaching that people received in that organization, it had been very much in line with the XP practices and that mm -hmm. way of thinking for years before uh, less was, uh, I think, even created, uh, at least mentioned explicitly. So it's it's difficult to like say that this is the cutoff point where we start preparing the transformation because we never thought about it that way. But there were, I think, two years of the workshops with with the volunteer teams that I described that uh, that were on top of that. So so it was about two years of working with several teams in the organization before before we started that but that was not the beginning of it at all right okay thanks so maybe i have another question uh did you use any measurements that would prove that the adaption was the actually uh, the rational approach to prove it to the management so th this was a a huge discussion point that we had in the beginning and uh, it was one that we had uh, a lot of problems coming up with an answer to because um, we already had 
a lot of measured things in the organization and the way I see it, uh, there is a inherent problem with uh, testing this kind of adoption by, uh, by a single measurement or a set of measurements and saying that you need to be here to be successful. Because most of the time, the companies do not have this one uh, specific uh, measurement of success. And if we tie a measurement of success to a change initiative, then we might just fake it to become uh, successful by design, a failure by design, or just irrelevant by design and game it. So uh, we, we will be looking at stuff like cycle time, value delivered, but these are very difficult to measure. And also there is a lot of different um, a lot of different uh, variables uh, that can come into place because the functionalities that you work on can be very, very different between each other. So it might be actually a lot of things other than the adoption itself that impact this. So the best uh, idea that we ended up having was just having a huge questionnaire towards the end of it from all the people that took part in this and that uh, were kind of around this. So teams, management, product management, the uh, area product owner. And it would, and those were mostly open questions like, was it better? Do you think we improved our cycle time? Do you think you improved your, uh, uh, well, yeah, was it better is, a, is, is so, sort of an open question. The other ones like we, we covered so some, uh, some stuff that uh, we thought would be likely impacted like uh, knowledge in specific uh, areas of the product, uh, et cetera. So the questionnaire was our main source of uh, determining whether that was a success or not. Yeah, so we also have uh, some questions on Yeah, Yeah, I, I, I see we've got, we've got questions on the chat. So yeah. what, what I would do now is I would go back to the, the first question that, that, we, that we have there from, from Eve, uh, which is, are all the teams co-located or how do you manage to spread across uh, the locations? So the the teams uh, the teams were co-located within the teams. Uh, so we had each of the teams was located in the same site, but we had teams from several sites within the same requirements area. So we had a lot of uh, video equipment for the shared ceremonies to to help with that. Also a lot of video calls to uh, to help with the day-to-day -day support in terms of working with the new specializations, uh, etc. But also on top of that, we had shared uh, participation by some of the team members in, in some of the training that we had. And uh, for some of the ceremonies, like every third or so uh, backlog refinements, we would have uh, the APO change between the sites. And also usually a few people from the other side would, would come along with them. So uh, we try to enable both the virtual sense of like uh, lessening the distance between the teams and also supporting that with, with some additional travel. And uh, I think that doing that every, every month or so helps a lot in lessening the detrimental impact of having teams in different lo locations. Thank you. Okay, uh, what was the size of whole team and what was the amount of delivery teams? Uh, whether the teams achieved deliverable product after first sprint or few sprints? Mm. So in terms of the, 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 the team, I think the biggest team we had was about 10 people, which is kind of against the less rules, but we, we didn't want to be super dogmatic because the team really wanted to stay uh, as, as they were. And the, the, the number of the delivery teams was gradually ramped up. So we started with two teams and worked our way up to eight, uh, about one, two sprints uh, at a time, adding the next team, sometimes maybe two. Um, and uh, in terms of the deliverability, the first uh, two sprints, I think, were, were particularly uh, difficult. After that, we had uh, we had uh, mostly uh, um, mostly every sprint there was something finished that already provided some kind of uh, value to the customer. Uh, however, all the time the product remained deliverable, just uh, there were sprints in the beginning that uh, uh, didn't produce any, uh, any customer value immediately. 
Uh, in the end, all the teams were, were able to, uh, to, to achieve that, but uh, it did have like this staggering period uh, in the beginning, probably because we forced, uh, we forced the initial ramp up of the teams a bit too quickly. And I think that's hindsight 2020, uh, doing that a bit slower would probably be uh, easier on, the, on us and would uh, allow us to get a bit better achievements. Uh, a bit more about ATDD, especially how this acceptance part goes with trust to the team. Mm. So I think that uh, the, 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 the thing that this aims to solve is not making sure that uh, the team do their work right and that this is uh, actually just a way of controlling the team. But rather than that, uh, this is just uh, actually trusting the team to implement the, uh, the tests in a way that uh, reflects the, the requirements that they settle with the business uh, side of things. Because in the end, the, the ATD is, is there for clarity. It is there to make, uh, to make things very comfortable, uh, comfortably, comfortably clear for both the teams and the stakeholders. And uh, if you end up writing the right thing in the acceptance tests, it still takes the trust um, to the team to actually accept that uh, this is what the tests do rather than just pass. It is very easy to write all of, this, uh, all of these tests and just light them up green if you want to, uh, but that misses the point entirely. So I think this has about as much uh, trust uh, in the team as any other approach. And I don't really think mm, that, it's, uh, that it impacts the, the amount of trust from the team or to the team. I'm not sure if I answered the right question or if I understood that question correctly. So uh, was that helpful at all, Aga? Yes, it was. Thanks a lot. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, Damien, uh, did we have multiple feature teams working on single trunk? If so, is there an ideal number working on the same trunk? Uh, yes, we had all the teams working on, uh, on the same trunk and the ideal number of teams is all of them. Uh, the, the fewer the better. However, if you already have 100 teams in your organization and you're going to have 100 teams, you should probably have 100 teams working on trunk. Uh, there are certain limitations to that, and uh, th this becomes quite interesting in the extreme scale of things, because when you have an organization with the size of thousands of people, you start running into corner cases for certain, uh, for certain version control systems. Like if you're going to have so much code stored in one place, in one repository, not a, not a matter of branching, but a matter of repository, if you're going to have that, uh, for several thousand of, uh, thousands of people, SVN will be extremely slow. However, with Git, you might fall into the trap of a push-pull race uh, condition where pushing your changes is impossible because every time you try to push, someone else already pushed some changes that you need to pull first. And it's just an ongoing cycle where people probably will start writing scripts to compete for time of the VCS server, and it's going to be a huge pain. So with truly huge uh, organizations like uh, Google and Facebook that approach a single repository, single branch approach. Uh, there are some articles, uh, one of them I already think you can uh, post uh, Facebook managed to create its own extensions to Mercurial to enable working in such a scale that uh, everybody can do that uh, in, in one trunk. But it all boils down to, uh, I guess, the mm, the perception of branching as giving safety because if, our, if we branch out and we work on our team's changes there, then the other teams won't pollute our code with their things. And we can just make sure that if, if something is broken, then it's us, it's very clear. Then we can just fix that and when it's ready, we just merge it back into the trunk and everything's fine. However, everybody who's done that enough times knows that the merging to trunk step can be extremely precarious there. So it's, it's, it's my understanding now, and it's my mo mental model, that every time we actually branch out, 
it is a kind of hide your head in the sand approach where we delay this pain of integrating with the other teams uh, until a point where, where there is a lot of conflict. If everybody is working on the trunk in small uh, changes, then th the conflicts will be small and we will catch them very quickly. If everybody is working on branches, then we run the risk of having several days of work being in heavy conflict with someone else. So to, to make this very, very long answer shorter, the fewer the better, but all the teams in that, that are working on your product, because the more teams you have working in isolation, the more potential conflicts you will have that pretty much explode. Uh, did we have different levels of planning, like high-level planning and team-level more detailed planning? Yes, this is basically a part of less. This is called planning one and planning two. So in planning one, uh, it is all, only a pre-selection. It is a very, very quick meeting where teams select items from the backlogs, and then they go uh, do their planning either by themselves or a more or less shared planning. So depending on the interconnectivity, of the items that the teams take for a sprint. Sometimes they might identify, okay, we need a new testing framework library that will support these three teams uh, items. So we can plan that together. They can do that in a room in three different corners of the room. And then they have a pretty good idea of the, uh, of the impact that the other teams have on their work and the support that the other teams can give them. But in general, there, there are two different uh, levels of planning. So the, the, the one with the product owner, potentially, where we select the items to do for the sprint, and then the detailed planning where we decompose those items into tasks that we take later on. When we started implementing less into the company, did we start working on a new product or an existing one? Uh, if an existing one, did we have to deal with technical debt? Yes, absolutely. We started on an existing product and with a huge organization that was working on that same product in parallel. So dealing with technical debt was uh, very much a factor all throughout the development. And uh, the way that we tried to achieve that was firstly, make sure not to make things worse and, uh, and always makes things better in the parts of the code that we touched. So uh, every time a team would, uh, would do something, there would be a pretty stringent definition of done. Uh, definitely a lot, more, mm, a lot more ambitious than the definitions of done for that product had been historically. So that would need to be automated, refactored properly, no deduplications, and, uh, and it, it would also be reviewed by, uh, by the other teams and uh, potentially also by the still existing component organizations, which all of them had their own mechanisms of dealing with uh, incoming uh, debt. And on the other hand, there was pre-existing debt that caused some additional failures, bugs, etc. These were pretty much just uh, prioritized in the backlog along with, uh, with all the others. And I think it was uh, a rule that the area product owner took that until uh, the list of bugs is empty, which is a extremely distant perfection goal, we would just take a set number of items, which is bug fixing per sprint as a area. Mm, what backlog management tool do you use? If you use Jira, could you tell me a bit more on how you organize it so, and maybe show some examples? So I think that uh, in terms of uh, product backlog management, Jira is not as harmful as it is for team backlog, which I would very, very much disincentivize. I wouldn't use Jira for that. But even for the product backlog, we, we used Excel, basically because it was extremely simple. It provided the area product owner with all the functionalities that they needed to just sort the items by, mm, uh, by priority and to take notes, etc. If we had uh, so some materials about, uh, about the item, like acceptance criteria, some detailed analysis, etc., we would just keep the information. Uh, I think we, we kept them in OneNote, but anyway, that was just something that we could link to in the backlog. And we wanted to keep the backlog as simple as possible. We didn't want to have uh, too many 
mappings or views or workflows or uh, responsibilities assigned. So Excel actually made it very good, made it very easy to limit the complexity of that. Some companies managed to make very, very complex backlogs using only Excel, but uh, we, we managed to, to, to keep it very, very simple. Uh, so it was basically just a prioritized list with, uh, with a status in terms of done, in progress, planned, uh, maybe a team aside and some notes that were linked. Very, very simple backlog. Mm. Okay, uh, these were all the questions that we had in chat. I, I see that uh, that Jürgen started to uh, to answer some of some of the, uh, the questions as well. Uh, are there any more questions? There is a question. It's not. Uh, it's an open answer. Oh, is it? Uh, how, ah, it is. How do we manage to do uh, to, to with these things that cross sprints uh, or many teams? We're going to clean up branch in the past. Uh, uh, we managed to not make any cleanup branches uh, for, for the stuff that we uh, that we had. So um, sometimes even making a small piece testable is so interweaving with technical depth to lots of other things that you cannot just disconnect it or isolate it in a, in a very short time frame. Uh, in, in these cases, I think we were relatively lucky in, in, in that we didn't really have, have to disconnect, but, but we, we already had so many um, uh, so many experiences working with the with the with technical debt also on a component level that uh, there, there was a number of uh, of techniques that the teams would try before resorting to branches i've seen uh, cleanup branches being utilized for some for some work in the distant distant past uh, and uh, I, I think that even in that case it would be possible to uh, mm, to uh, work around that by just temporarily adding some duplication. So you could basically just have uh, a duplicated uh, system of logic if, you're, if the, the, the piece of code that you are working on is connected to a horrendously ugly thing that is very, very difficult to uh, um, decouple from, from something else, then to just, couple, uh, to just copy that. And rather than replacing all the usages at once, switch the uh, the parts of the code that use the old ugly stuff to the new pretty stuff one by one. You temporarily introduce some more conceptual duplication, which is uh, some more technical debt on top of the technical debt. But as a trade-off, you, uh, you have the possibility of keeping that continuously integrated. You have the visibility of your changes and you, you, see, you can see that the other teams that will be working in the meantime they will also notice that, or hopefully, if you, communicate, uh, if you communicate it well enough or if they're careful enough, they can notice that there is this new thing and we shouldn't be connecting to this old ugly thing anymore. <laughs> okay, thanks. Sorry, uh, because yeah, I, I just saw your, uh, your uh, uh, description of the, of the problem towards the end and I assumed it was uh, an example of, uh, of an answer. Uh, are there any more questions? There is <clears throat> from Damien. How long did it take for first release to launch to production? Uh, so as, uh, as mentioned already, uh, the, 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 the release cycle was still kept from the uh, general product. So uh, I think those were still yearly cycles at the time that that happened. So still, even though we already had the, the high level testing done, and so even though we had a very whole product perspective on that, because uh, the majority of the company still worked in a uh, centralized management, uh, program driven uh, release mode, this, Part of the uh, this part of the work wasn't really impacted by the change, so quite long, I think, a year, unfortunately. 
Yes, I, can you tell me, I'm wondering um, if you had, let's call it preparation period, <laughs> Uh, if you had, it, it, then how long did it take for people to, uh, to, be, to feel more comfortable with what less is and with all those technical um, practices? Uh, be, and, and what was the, how long did it take before the flip, before you started uh, future teams and, and, and first spin? So this, this, this is extremely varied and I think that in an organization of this scale there will always be extremely different approaches to this in, uh, in different places of the organization. We've had some teams that after just like the first day of uh, ALS training would say look this is, this is the thing, this is what I've been waiting for for like several years, let's do this immediately and everything will be so much better. Other people would never really come, come around to it and would just try and avoid it at all costs until the very end, even when it started working. So your mileage will vary extremely and uh, the, the approaches will be, uh, will be very different. But in your, in your case, do you know maybe how, how, how long was the period before the first last spring? Uh, it, it, in, in the case of the team that I worked with most closely, it was about a year, I think, between, between their training and, uh, and the workshop where we made the explicit decision. However, it, 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 it's not planned because, because the team needed some more time. It's just the way things unfolded in terms of when we could do the workshops and when we could do the trainings and the supporting for the team. So it was, uh, it was mostly that. And, uh, in different parts of the organization, we just had different different levels of support. But when you have uh, when you need to to do this workshop, the way I uh, I mentioned, like having the head of product for a really huge company or a CEO, if it's a single product company, because you really need that level of authority in the room, plus a good chunk of the high management, some line management, product management, etc. You will probably be more limited in your rate of adoption by being able to get all of these people in the same room within the next two years than by the the organization itself okay if there's uh, no more questions for now then thank you everybody for the participation it's been a fun uh, it's been fun and uh, a nice learning experience it's it's really weird uh, doing meetups in this form, but uh, it's, it's, it's nice to make the best of it. And thanks for choosing to, to spend your time this way. It's been fun. Thank you, Jacek, and uh, see you soon, I hope. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much. See you. Bye. Thank you, everyone.